Science for All, a master teacher's orientation to integrating science and diversity, a project funded by the U.S. Department of Education's Institute of the Education Sciences and implemented by the Center for Research on Education, Diversity, and Excellence. Welcome to CREED's Master Teacher Orientation for the Integrating Science and Diversity in K-8 Classrooms project. My name is Maxine mckinney DeRoyston, and I'll be walking you through this orientation as we explain more about our project, our pedagogy, and your involvement. Thank you for agreeing to participate in this important work and sharing your expertise with the pre-service teachers. This DVD will introduce you to the Integrating Science and Diversity Project, orient you to Creed's philosophy on effective pedagogy, explain the expectations of and benefits for master teachers coaching one of the pre-service elementary teachers involved in our project, and share with you how we've integrated our thoughts on effective science pedagogy into a pre-service teacher science methods course. We hope this video aids your work with pre-service teachers and serves as a resource for you as a teacher. Let me first outline the structure of this orientation. This DVD is segmented into a series of four chapters that will orient you toward our research center and our current project. The DVD begins with an overview of the project and the research design that guides our study about how to train pre-service teachers to teach science with diverse learners in mind. Next, we'll discuss your role in this project as an educator and mentor to a pre-service student teacher and the benefits of your participation. We then introduce you to Creed's philosophy on effective pedagogy through presenting a few video excerpts that provide an in-depth look into Creed standards and how they have been found to be especially effective in assisting diverse learners to achieve academically. Finally, we'll discuss why integrating the rich science curriculum and pedagogy with that of the cultural and linguistic resources of students is so critical and how the pre-service teachers have been trained in their science methods course to deliver effective science instruction. Let's begin. The Integrating Science and Diversity Project. This project represents one of Creed's ongoing research activities. You may be familiar with recent Creed activities such as the Sheltered Instruction Observation Protocol, or SIAP, that aims to develop content and language with English learners, or perhaps the past Kamehameha project involving Native Hawaiian students that resulted in the development of the Creed 5 Standards for Effective Pedagogy. Creed Research's projects are situated in a wide range of settings with diverse student populations. From classrooms with predominantly Zuni-speaking students in New Mexico, to inner city schools in Florida, to California elementary schools with large populations of native Spanish-speaking students. The aim of these various programs of research is to produce a range of publications and other tools that serve to help teachers implement best practices in the classroom. Now that you know a little bit about CREED as a research center, let's focus more specifically on the Integrating Science and Diversity Project. Who's involved with the Integrating Science and Diversity Project? What is the project about? And how do we conduct our research? The next few slides will answer these questions. This project includes faculty, postdoctoral fellows, and graduate student researchers at California State University Stanislaus, San Francisco State University, University of California Berkeley, and University of California Santa Cruz. Two key members of this project are Professor Trish Stoddart and Professor Marco Bravo. We'll first meet Professor Trish Stoddart who is the principal investigator of the Integrating Science and Diversity Project. And next, we'll meet Professor Marco Bravo, who is another member of the research team and co-taught along with Professor Isabel Quita, one of the science methods courses taken by the pre-service teachers. So my name is Trish Stoddart. I'm a professor of education at UC Santa Cruz and a senior researcher with CREED. Um, I'm the PI of this project. Um, my area of expertise is science education and teacher education, and I work um, specifically on 
improving the teaching and learning of cultural and language minority students in science. Hello, my name is Marco Bravo and I'm an assistant professor at San Francisco State University where I teach courses in language and literacy development, training future teachers. On this project I serve as a lead researcher looking specifically at ways in which we can train teachers to teach science in ways that engage all students and in particular second language learners. These, this is a population that we are specifically interested in seeing the changing demographics across the United States where English learners are becoming a dominant population in schools. Other members of the research team that may be visiting your classroom to observe the pre-service teacher that you are mentoring are pictured here. Later in the video, you will also meet Roland Tharp, the director of the center, as well as hear from Professor Michael Stevens, who along with Ramon Vega de Jesus taught another pre-service science methods course. For now, let's focus on understanding the parameters of this project and what we're interested in finding out. The Integrating Science and Diversity Project is a federally funded research and development program with the aim of developing a model of pre-service teacher preparation that integrates the Creed 5 standards for effective pedagogy at every stage of teacher preparation, from prerequisite science content courses to science teaching methods courses and credential programs, through the experience of student teaching and finally into coaching and support during the first year of teaching. This research-based effort is focused on improving the education of and making science accessible to students whose ability to reach their potential is challenged by language or cultural barriers, race, geographic location, or poverty. Professor Tris Stoddart explains why this work is so important. In teacher education, the same type of separation between the teaching of science content and the teaching of language occurs. So very often in the pre-service teacher education program or the professional development program, teachers learn about science teaching and science curriculum in one module or one unit. And then in a quite separate module or unit, they explore issues of language and culture. What needs to happen is both those domains need to be brought together. We need to integrate knowledge about teaching culturally and linguistically diverse students with knowledge about teaching inquiry science. And it is that kind of integration that is taking place in this project and takes place with the Creed 5 standards. We know that this project involves a long-term commitment to teacher professional development, starting with collaboration with teacher education programs and on to working alongside seasoned teachers such as yourselves. In this chapter, we'll continue to discuss how this three-year project actualizes this commitment through exploring the benefits of such pre-service teacher training on student learning and achievement outcomes in the domain of science. We ground this study on integrating science and diversity through the use of these three questions. Do creed-trained pre-service teachers more effectively teach science than non-trained creed pre-service teachers? Second, what instructional impact do creed-trained master teachers have on pre-service teachers' preparation? Third, for first-year teachers, is higher use of creed pedagogy and science teaching associated with greater student achievement? Based on those research questions, our study compares two groups of pre-service teachers. Those in a control situation where they receive the standard training and an experimental group that is receiving the redesigned curriculum and trainings on CREED standards. You'll notice that we have 75 pre-service teachers in each condition for a total of 150 participants. The variables we are considering are one, whether students receive a traditional or creed-infused science methods course. Two, whether they are placed with a master teacher that has information about the creed standards. And three, whether they receive a creed-trained observer to provide feedback to the pre-service teacher. Looking at the methodology matrix, you can see that at every step, 
From coursework to student teaching and mentorship, we have tried to infuse the experimental pre-service teacher's experience with the Creed standards. The gray shaded box that is highlighted in the final row indicates where you, as the master teacher, will be engaged with our project and will positively impact the pre-service teacher's ability to deliver science lessons that take into account diverse learners. The pre-service teachers you'll be working with are being trained at several credentialing and teaching institutions, including the California State University Santa Slaus Teacher Education Program in cooperation with Modesto City Schools. And San Francisco State University's Elementary Education Department that works with San Francisco, Berkeley, and Oakland City Schools. Next, let's discuss how we restructured the science methods courses of those pre-service teachers involved in our experimental group. The first year of our project was focused on redesigning the traditional science methods course into a student-centered, inquiry-based approach. It's important to note that the student teacher that is placed in your classroom has participated in a creed-infused science methods course, which differs substantially from traditional science methods courses in the following ways. First, traditional science methods are often in lecture format. The creed-infused course that the pre-service teachers attended, however, was very interactive and hands-on with California-adopted science materials. Second, Traditional courses often consist of self-contained science, meaning they don't present how science is integrated with other subject areas, such as math and or language arts. The Creed Infused course was cross-disciplinary, including elements of health, science, and language arts. The third key difference is the development of science lesson plans. The traditional format of a science methods course tends to be a collection of lesson plans combined into a teaching unit about a science domain, like earth, life, and or physical science, whereas the Creed Infused course required candidates to develop a teaching unit that incorporated the inquiry process to ensure that students were involved in lessons that followed the format scientists use to investigate the natural world around us. Fourth, traditional science courses tend to focus on science pedagogy or how to teach science. The Creed course, by contrast, involved helping pre-service teachers understand science and the scientific method in order to integrate those understandings into their pedagogical practices for all students, particularly diverse learners. Finally, a critical difference between what the pre-service teachers received and what students in the control class received was that the Creed infused course addressed all science standards, earth science, life science, physical science, as well as the nature of science. This shift in pedagogy occurred through the weaving in of creed principles through the critical readings and small group discussions structured around those readings, as well as through classroom investigations on different science topics and themes. In the following video clip, Professor Michael Stevens, who co-taught the Creed-infused Science Methods course with Professor Vega de Jesus, will speak in greater detail about some of these activities. I got my master's degree and PhD in botany from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And between my two degrees, I taught science at an elementary school, and that really got me interested in biology education. I participated in a fellowship called KTI, it's kindergarten through infinity. And the idea is to train graduate students in science to be better teachers, and then to link university resources with K through 12 education. So when I finished my um, PhD, I started here at CSU Stanislaus, and I have, I have two um, major research focuses. One is in plant ecology. I, for my PhD, I studied plant herbivore interactions. And I'm interested in, in the interactions of genes and the environment and how plants respond to um, pressure from herbivores. I'm, and then I also conduct research in biology education. I was involved in redesigning a credential course, um, Science and Health Methods, and uh, with, a, with a team of, of faculty from Stanislaus and San Francisco State and Berkeley, we worked to um, retool the existing class and focus on um, inquiry-based science, and we were interested in increasing the level of content in a methods class. And we also worked in the, the creed five standards for effective pedagogy. 
So once we redesigned the class, then um, I team taught the class with Ramon Vega de Jesus. He's a um, professor in the College of Education here at Stanislaus. And my role was to um, model hands-on activities. So rather than talking about hands-on act hands activities, the students actually got to participate in the activities that they could involve their students in. So we, we did activities on life science and physical science and earth science. And I emphasized the nature of scientific inquiry. They collected data. We discussed the variation and variability in data and how to interpret it, how to produce a figure. They wrote a scientific research report. And one of the, the major um, focuses of the class was a long-term inquiry project using isopods. They're um, pill bugs or potato bugs. And so students um, went out and they started by going out. We talked about what a habitat is uh, and where, it's, where an organism lives and, and finds its food and the things that it needs. And so we talked about the ideas about habitat. And, and then instead of stopping there and saying, OK, go home and memorize habitat, the new vocabulary word, they actually went outside and used their knowledge to find isopods. And they brought them back into the classroom. And then they were able to ask some of their own questions. So rather than um, having a worksheet where they fill in the correct answer, um, they actually drove the, their, their own education. And so that's what we'd like these, these teachers to replicate in their classrooms rather than having the students be involved in, in a, a list of terms to be memorized, they should ask their own questions, hypothesize, and figure out how to um, collect the data that they need. In addition to redesigning the pre-service science methods course, we used several tools administered multiple times to test the effects of the intervention received by the pre-service teachers. These tools include a survey to chronicle how their dispositions towards science teaching change over time, interviews with a subset of pre-service teachers to dig deeper into their attitudes toward the intervention, a science assessment to gauge how much science background candidates have and acquire, and finally, observations of the teaching of science lessons during their student teaching placement and again when they are first year teachers. In the next chapter, we'll discuss more specifically your role as a master teacher and the expectations and benefits of your participation. Master Teachers What is the role of the master teacher in the Integrating Science and Diversity Project? For you, as a master teacher, the responsibilities for being engaged in our project include the viewing of this DVD and the completion of a written reflection about the DVD contents, and the completion of a survey that asks for demographic information including the number of years you have been teaching, the grade levels you've taught, the science curriculum you've used, and so forth. Also, along with coordinating the teaching of acquired academic subjects for your school and of your classroom, we would like you to provide some support for the teaching of science in your classroom. This would include providing the pre-service teacher with opportunities to teach three science lessons of at least 40 minute duration each during the spring semester. You should allow these three science lessons to be observed by a pre-researcher. With you, as the master teacher, collaborating with the creed researcher on the second of those student teacher observations. This would be a co-observation in which you, the master teacher, and the creed research member will use the observation tool to provide the pre-service teacher with constructive feedback. And finally, you're responsible for mentoring the pre-service teacher into the profession during the student teaching assignment. For your time and dedication to the project, we will provide each master teacher with a $550 stipend at the end of the semester. Your participation with our project will be in addition to that required for the pre-service teacher mentorship by their university. We believe that in supporting the pre-service teacher and through engaging in this orientation, you will be exposed to new ideas about successful science teaching. We hope that you will agree. Please look at the timeline we've mapped out for the semester. Note the dates you should keep in mind. 
including viewing this DVD and completing and mailing in the survey you received by the end of February. Next, in early March, we will ask the student teacher to teach their first science lesson in your classroom, and we will be present to observe the student teacher. Similarly, in April, we'll ask the pre-service teacher to teach the second science lesson, and we hope at this point to be able to co-observe the lesson with you. Finally, during the month of May, we will conduct the third and final observation of the pre-service teacher. Creed Pedagogy The Center for Research on Education, Diversity, and Excellence offers a theory of teaching and learning developed over 20 years of research that has examined how more effective classrooms provide support for student learning. Creed has synthesized this research into a teaching philosophy that calls to attention five ways that more effective classrooms are distinct than less successful classrooms. Creed refers to these five ways as the five standards of effective pedagogy. Let's be clear, these five standards of effective pedagogy do not represent a teaching blueprint or an explicit teaching model. Rather, these five standards relate to a theory of teaching and learning that is similar to a set of best practices or principles of learning. When the integration of these five standards is found in classrooms across diverse ethnic and linguistic communities, more learning is happening and students tend to do much better in assessments across subject areas. These standards are based on research in diverse populations and across grade levels, subject areas, and language groups. Professor Roland Tharp, director of CREED, discusses with us the five standards. Our research indicates that there are, that there are, there are five basic aspects of pedagogy that occur and reoccur in every cultural and linguistic group and are associated with academic success. These are established by consensus. These are what we find over and over and over again at every grade level, every subject matter, every linguistic group, every cultural group. If you can con create the, the following conditions, you'll maximize academic achievement. The first one is, is that teachers and students need to work together in a productive way. That translates into some aspects of cooperative learning. Learning the language of instruction needs to be a meta goal of all the school day across the curriculum. If instruction is in English, then the learning of English needs to be a goal during science, during social studies, during mathematics, that that needs to be done throughout the day, not in an English lesson. That incidentally extends, uh, that learning the language of instruction also extends to the language as its subject matter. So our third basic principle is that one of the tasks of good pedagogy is making meaning, and that making meaning means it means embedding the abstract and knowledge of school during the instruction period of embedding that in the concerns, experiences, and expectations of the, of the students themselves. We can't purely cognitize something unless we have also can attach it to our experience. Uh, the fourth one is and, and is is that you, you simply must have cognitively challenging activities. You've got, to, you've got to press kids to learn and you've got to set high standards for kids and continually move them forward to continually take the next step of understanding. And that, uh, that kind of pressure needs to be unrelenting. What, what's so sad about it is, is that for many at-risk kids until very recently, the standard prescription, I still hear it, well, for kids that are not getting it, what they need to do is more trials on basic skills. So that's thus the, thus the drill and kill environment of that many underachieving kids face, and that is dead wrong because kids learn what you teach them, and if you teach them to think, they'll learn to think. And then the fifth thing is, is that, and this, this I think it may very well be the hardest for everybody to do, is that uh, instruction needs to be dialogic. And we are, in schools of the common tradition, are so committed 
to the lecture as the as the tent pole that holds up school that we are it's very difficult to replace that with the with the notion that best instruction occurs in sharing ideas question and answer only in that way is it possible for a teacher to know what it is a student does know and what it needs to know next and only through that kind of conversation is it possible for the for the learner to be able to exercise their current level ability and continue to strain toward expressing and understanding the next so what we think of is uh, what ought to be the what ought to be the foundation of the instruction is not the lecture I'm not saying we shouldn't have any but that should not be the foundation but it should be a conversation when you see a classroom and that when with that, that's all happening that everybody says well that's just good teaching right so let's just all go, go do good teaching and then the problem of under attainment of uh, diversity would disappear but what we find is over and over again if you do those five things you can't get there from here you can't get from what my wife refers to as a, the um, classroom organized like a cemetery in which we give <laughs> rows and ranks and files and it's very quiet and <laughs> yeah, it's moving from that you can't get to what I'm talking about from there you have to start over again you really do have to have a different vision of a classroom in which in which what um, in which there's multiple simultaneous activities in which the teacher is actively engaged with small groups of kids or with an individual kid moving around and the rest of the kids are working under their own recognizance assisting one another to learn while they can and to the extent that they can and in which uh, the kids are engaged because the activities are meaningful to them in which there is a rich soup of language in which the learn in which learning the appropriate language to discuss different issues is going on and in which instead of one act of communication coming from the teacher or, but, or uh, in which there is a rich network of communication going on in which the activities are challenging in which everybody's moving forward at all times to take the next step of complexity and in which both kids with each other and especially the, the teacher with the students regularly has a, a focused, serious academic conversation. Now, if you do that, it, it doesn't look like school. And that's what, uh, that's what I would hope for the next generation is that schools don't look like schools. To help us see what some of these standards for effective pedagogy might look like, here are a couple of examples from a second grade classroom. This first example shows the development of student scientific thinking before and after experiencing a science curriculum that infuses science lessons with language and literacy practices. In this pre-post assessment, students were first asked to write questions they had about meadows and forests. Writing researchable questions was a goal of this curriculum, and in the pretest, you notice the student's response focused on aesthetic elements about meadows, such as, why are meadows beautiful? This question is not easily researched, and the method of scientific inquiry cannot be applied. On the post-test, which occurred after students had multiple opportunities to read, write, talk about, and construct their own researchable questions, we see a true development. This student asks what kind of shelter there is in forests, and how spiders survive in the winter. These questions highlight the development of an understanding about how to do science. The student also demonstrates some advances in understanding the scientific language through the use of the words shelter and survive, both of which are words and concepts key to understanding how habitats work. In this next pre-post assessment sample from the same second grade science and language curriculum, we see a more pronounced development of science language, where students use such vocabulary as taproot and fibrous root at post-test. These words were emphasized in the science curriculum. They are used here, especially as they are coupled with an accurate graphic representation, demonstrate this student's understanding. These examples, again, exemplify the types of gains possible when language is addressed explicitly in content area instruction.
take a moment before moving on to the next segment to reflect on how teachers promote more successful classroom learning environments. You can think of this question in terms of the types of teaching practices, student roles, classroom activities, and lessons they might develop and use. Write down a few of your ideas and continue thinking about this question as you watch the following video of a kindergarten classroom engaged in a science lesson about plant life. This next video contains many exemplary characteristics of effective pedagogy that you might find very familiar. Again, the focus question is, how do teachers promote more successful classroom learning environments? If you need more time, Please pause the video here and restart when you are ready. You can also watch this video in its entirety in the Best Practices video section that is accessible via the main menu of this DVD. My question. What does a seed need? to grow. Okay? Do you have an idea, Casey, how does a seed grow? What do you what does a seed need to be able to grow? Need water. Okay? Need water. Okay. Does anyone else can anyone else name one thing? Kaleo Nani? What else does a seed need? What? Paint? What does paint do for a seed? Well, we'll find out. We'll see. Does anyone else have an idea? Rachel? Uh, it turns it color. But what does it need to grow into a flower? Naya, do you have a What? It grows big. What does it need to grow big? Melissa. Big. Wait, I'm asking Melissa. She had her hand up. Dirt. Yeah. It needs dirt. Dirt that's clean. Dirt that's clean? Okay, Melissa said it needs dirt, and you say it needs dirt that's clean. Needs to grow in the ground. Okay, I have a little poem. Make your dirt. Make your hand your dirt. This is your earth, or dirt, or soil. Okay, and it's clean kind. Okay, dig a little hole, plant a little seed, pour a little water, pull a little weed, chase a little bug. Hi ho, there he goes. Add a little sunshine. Can you make a brown sun? Grow a little grow. Let's try that one more time, and then I'll read you the seed story. Dirt. So you were right. Who said dirt? Uh, Melissa and Maya. Oh, I forgot to put clean in there. Oh, well. Dig a little hole. Plant a little seed. Pour a little water. Pull a little weed. Chase a little bug. Hi ho, there you go. Add a little sunshine. Grow a little rose or a little flower. I have this book. You know what the title of the book is? The Sea. And the author is Joy Cowley and the illustrator is Philip Webb. The Sea. What do you see on this picture? Where are they digging it? Looks like sand. It could be dirt. They're using a little shovel and a... Right, right. Smart. I did that. You must have planted before. Annie and Bobby planted a seed. Who's holding the seed, the boy or the girl? Boy. This looks just like the seed digging up the dirt with the shovel. They watered it. This is a watering can, and I have one sort of like that. A brand new one for you to use. They watered it, but it didn't grow. See anything? 
growing there? They raked it, but it didn't grow. You see anything popping up out of the ground? Any surprise? Okay. It's not going to grow, said Annie. Hmm. He's thinking. You see how he has his hand right by him? He's thinking. Sometimes. Hmm. It's not going to grow, said Bobby. Because maybe they mixed up. Maybe they mixed up. Let's see. They went away and forgot it. They put a little sign in here that said what it was. They went away. They forgot all about that seed. One day, Dad said, Hey, come look at this. I wonder what he wants them to look at. Maybe the seed grows. Maybe. That's a good idea. It's huge, just like our ipus outside are huge. Hey, Bobby. Hey. This little seed is what you are going to get to plant. <coughs> and you are going to get to, <coughs> you're going to have to dig your little hole, plant your seed, and you're going to add some water. And we're going to leave it in the sun. And we're going to see how long it takes to grow. Pause again here and take some time to think about how this teacher initiated her science lesson on the role of seeds in plant life. Did you find her using effective teaching and learning strategies? If so, which ones? In this first part of the video, we observe several strategies and teaching maneuvers that support important elements of the teaching and learning process and represent Creed's first standard called joint productive activity. In a joint productive activity, the teacher and students work together to accomplish identified curricular goals. The teacher collaborates with students and engages them in authentic inquiry activities where their knowledge and perspectives are valued. Thus, the teacher promotes an understanding among students that they too can be generators of knowledge, rather than it resting solely in the head of the teacher or between the pages of a book. The teacher also promotes the creation, sharing, and evaluation of tangible products, such as the list of researchable questions, and or intangible products, such as the oral presentation of students' findings or understanding about a concept or process. In this video, we see the teacher's activities promoting the collaboration of students through their sitting in a group around the teacher, the text, and the list they contribute to, focusing the whole class on the same question, how long does a seed need to grow? The teacher elicits and incorporates students' contributions into the lesson and produces a list that documents their contributions. In the second standard, Language and Literacy Development, the teacher promotes student engagement with authentic literacy tasks. Authentic literacy tasks represent the types of literacy activities that are germane to the subject matter, which in the case of science might include scientific reports, the creation of data tables, or the use of scientific reference materials to validate a claim. The teacher also makes explicit connections between the multiple meanings of words to provide opportunities for students to translate between colloquial language and the language of the subject domain. To do this, the teacher models the discourse of the subject and provides students with feedback on their use of it. This helps to build students' domain-specific vocabulary and creates bridges between students' primary language or dialect and various academic registers. Professor Marco Bravo explains how a project embraces this standard of language and literacy and why it's crucial for all students learning content domains and particularly for English language students. 
a main approach that we are taking in helping pre-service teachers develop an understanding of the scientific enterprise is to illuminate a little bit more clear the ways in which language and literacy can support science learning. And when we mention literacy in, in respect to this project, we are really referencing more authentic practices of literacy, and these are authentic by way of a set of activities that are prominent in the way in which scientists use literacy to support their own science understandings, things such as uh, reading reference materials and writing uh, expository reports about their findings. And the we have a lot of evidence that demonstrates that English language learners are particularly benefited by integrating science, language, and literacy education. We know that by giving them multiple modalities to understand science activity that in essence we're giving them different entry points into understanding science and in return science is providing a real authentic context for which students can actually sharpen their academic language register. In essence what we have been noting is that English language learners academic language proficiency increases when we begin to demystify the language of science and give instructional attention to language in the science classroom. In the video excerpt you saw earlier, there was also a concentrated focus on language and literacy development for the purposes of understanding science, or in this case, for understanding the properties of seeds and plant life. Two things that the teacher focused on during this first part of the lesson was emphasizing the science vocabulary related to the lesson and also the use of an authentic science literacy practice of asking researchable questions. Authentic science literacy relates to the use of reading and writing tasks that more closely mirror those of real world scientists. Teachers are also often in a position to bridge school language with science language, as we see here with the story and the list of properties associated with seeds. Professor Tris Stoddard explains how the learning of science and the learning of language, either a second language, as in the case of English language learners, or discipline-specific language, are reciprocal processes that enable students to contextualize what they learn. So the traditional approach uh, to teaching academic content to English language learners is to separate out the teaching of the subject matter from the teaching of language. And the consequence of that is that very often English language learners do not get access to higher order content in elementary school because it's assumed that they cannot learn science until they have already become proficient in the English language. Now we would argue uh, that this is not the case. In actual fact, inquiry science is a very powerful context for learning language. You cannot learn science without learning language. What happens in an inquiry science lesson is that the use of language, the discussion that takes place, the science vocabulary that is learned is contextualized, which really assists in both the understanding of the language and the understanding of the science concept. So from our perspective, the relationship between science and language is reciprocal. By bringing them together, we enhance the learning on both domains. The third standard, contextualization, aims to promote the design of instructional activities that are meaningful to students, such that they have different avenues by which to enter into the sense-making activities in the classroom. Meaningful activities are those that resonate with students based on their home, local, and past school experiences, such that they can build from and apply those to the current context. This involves the teacher's elicitation of students' understanding and experiences. The teacher then helps to make explicit the contrasts and connections across these different ways of knowing that originate at home, school, or in local or other contexts and applies those skills or understandings to classroom tasks and activities. Here, Professor Tris Stoddard elaborates on the need for contextualization. What we need to help novice teachers understand is that when they are teaching science, they are also teaching language. 
and what is of critical importance is to contextualize the use of language in a science lesson. So therefore to relate the words, the ideas, to hands-on activities, to visual representations, to concrete activities. This is contextualization. And that they should very rarely use decontextualized or abstract language where the words are used without any concrete referent. In the lesson we watched, we saw a deliberate attempt by the teacher to contextualize students' understanding of seeds. For example, the teacher encourages the students to make contributions to the discussion by asking, what does a seed need to grow? Which is a question that all students can potentially contribute something to figuring out. She then listened to students' responses about seeds and validated their contributions by building on the connections that students made from local science phenomenon and home community practices. We will now resume playing the rest of the video segment that follows from where we left off. Please continue making notes of any additional strategies or teacher moves that you think represent effective teaching maneuvers. See, so the first thing you have to do I'll show you. You can walk around. Okay, now let's come and look at number one. This side. You're going to walk around the table and follow directions to plant the seed. This says, number one, choose a pot. Okay, but not yet. We'll, we'll, we'll read them first. Oh, we go this way. Okay. Number two, spoon dirt into pot. Here's the dirt, and we'll have it. Number three, poke a hole in the dirt with a in our poem, we dug a hole with our fingers, but in this picture, we can hold the hole with our Then number four, look at the seeds. How many seeds do you take? One. One. It says put equal seed in the hole and cover it with dirt. And then number five, what do you think this says? Pour Pour water into the pot. And then... Poke your name tag in the dirt so we know who to get. Okay? So, the first thing, we're going to try and see if you could follow the direction. Okay. Let's have Keone. You follow the directions around the table. <coughs> back over to one a little more dirt. I think he didn't quite have enough. His name tag he noticed wouldn't. Can you see him? Kainala is good. He did it. And Kainala go put it over on our garden wall. Mm -hmm. Could you poke your name tag into it? I put my water wall. I forgot to put my water wall. Some more dirt. Some more. Oh, you like a little shade on yours? Okay. Okay, if you're not looking at the numbers, can you put them in order of what happened first, second, third? Let's see. I'm not even going to talk. I'm going to shut my mouth like this. And I want you kids to work together. We'll start on this side and it goes to the right. It okay, starts here. All right, you guys, you can look and talk about it. And let's see if this group can put them in the right order. I think this one comes first. Oh, here, you, let's see. You know what I'm going to do? This hey, will help you. Miss Sherry? Huh? Maybe one time when we're even look. bigger and we're at another school and we have to do this, uh -huh. we should, like, cover up the numbers and close your eyes and try to remember them. 
That's a good idea. You can remember it any way you want. What number is that? One. 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 Two. Here's two. Here's three. Here's four. Here's five. And here's six. So put the card, the first thing that happened, under the number one card. Put it here. And let everybody help you. Okay. Which is the first? Talk about it. Help. Come on. Now I want you to tell me what you did. You put them in all in order. Okay, tell me. Look at the first one. Let's see if you're right. What, no, no, don't move the number. Tell me what you did. Tell me what what that says to do. Get the cup. Okay, get the cup. Okay, what is the next one then? Mika, what's the next one? Okay, and what's the next one? Wait, wait, wait. Wait till we're all finished, Kainala. What is the next one then? We're going to check if you're right before you go. What is this one? Big. Big, okay. No, sit here. And what is the fourth one? Put water. Put water. And then what is this one? Is that what you did first and second? I mean, uh, you put the water in and then you put the seeds? Do you think that was right, Kainalu? Look. No, look. Wait, Pour the water and then you we put the seed. We mixed something up. I think what did you mix up? In the wrong place. Can you help them, Kainalu? You mixed something up. What is it? All the numbers in are incorrect. See, the numbers are in correct order. Yeah, but maybe... What is not in correct order? Can you tell, Chelsea? Choose a pot. No, you said get the cup, put the dirt in, dig the hole, pour the water, put the seed. That's What's wrong. wrong. Hmm. Is that how you did it? Put the, what is no. it called? Seed. Put the seed. seed. Okay. Seed and then what after put the seed? No, this one. Water. Water and then what's the last one? Sure. Put, your okay. in. Put your name card. All right, take off the plasticine, see if you're right. Mm -hmm. yes, no. yeah. It's like clay. Yes. Oh, you're right, that's one right. Start undoing them. Good. See, here's some more. Help each other undo. Sure. Do all the numbers match? Right. Yes. So, did you do it right? Yes. You got uh, it in the order. Yeah. All right, give yourself a hand. Yay. Oh, let me get your picture so we can... Take into account what you've observed. Let's listen as Professor Trish Stoddard analyzes the effectiveness of this teacher. The example you have just seen, the teacher does two very important things. First, she talks to the students about the science concept as they are physically playing with the materials, touching, feeling, smelling. The use of language is contextualized throughout this teaching event. The second important thing that she does in this example is that she moves from the children's personal language where they begin with talking about the compost being yucky, a children's version um, of what um, those smells 
and those textures mean. And then she moves them through from their language to the scientific, technical language. She moves them from yucky to decomposition. Pause again here and take some time to think, and if necessary, take notes, about how this teacher followed up on her science lesson on seeds. What did you notice about how the teacher approached the rest of the lesson? Did you see the teacher using any new or different moves in the last sequence of interactions that you found to be effective? The fourth standard is challenging activities. This standard relates to both, one, increasing student cognitive complexity or higher order thinking skills through the practicing of those skills, and two, promoting more developed, precise, or deeper understandings of content or lessons. There is a reciprocal relationship here between processes of learning and content knowledge development. The teacher models for students how to use discipline-specific metacognitive strategies. These strategies are required for students to take classroom work to levels of more advanced understanding of content knowledge. In science, it means, for example, making judgments of science data or the testing out of questions through inquiry. The teacher also must provide explicit feedback on students' performance to allow students to interpret and apply that feedback to their practices. In the second part of this science lesson on seeds that we just saw, the teacher guided the lesson into an inquiry activity to answer the question of how long it takes for seeds to grow. The teacher created small groups of four students that worked together to complete inquiry tasks laid out by the teacher. Despite this being a kindergarten classroom, the students were challenged cognitively to engage in a complex activity that required them to plant seeds individually while following six specific steps. In this case, there's a lot of scaffolding of the inquiry process and understanding the sequence of conducting an experiment. The fifth and final standard, instructional conversations, refers to the quality of teacher talk in relation to student talk that promotes the articulation of learning and new connections in what is being learned. Here, the teacher seeks to create situations in which teachers and students engage in rich, sustained discussions that require discipline-specific reasoning skills. In these conversations, the teacher models the conversation and creates opportunities for students to ask authentic questions and build upon one another's responses. Instructional conversations are opportunities for students to address topics of their interest and engage in their preferred ways of talking with one another and the teacher. At the same time, the teacher can use this opportunity to build students' language use and reasoning skills through questioning students, elaborating more fully on their contributions, and or recasting and connecting ideas across individuals, different lessons, units, or even subject matters. A key element of an instructional conversation is that student talk occurs more frequently than teacher talk because all the students should make verbal contributions to the conversation. In the last video segment, you heard the teacher asking many questions in order to initiate a back and forth dialogue with students. For the most part, these teacher questions were authentic questions that probed into students' thinking more so than into known answer responses. Research shows that the more students verbalize their thinking, the more it becomes stored in their long-term memory. This standard relates to the important role that teachers play in supporting student conversation of their learning. Now that you've heard about the different standards, let's talk about why it's important to change the way we teach and learn science. And here are some reflections from one of the educators who recently taught a Creed Infused Science Methods course. Why should we change how we teach and learn science? Many of us have strong beliefs about the state of education and how students are performing, especially in content domains, such as science. Please take a couple of minutes to read the following true or false statements and jot down your responses before moving on to the next section.
Now that you've thought about how you view the current state of science education in K-8 schools, let's see what the research says. First, we present a video from the Lawrence Hall of Science. California ranks next to last in science on the National Assessment of Educational Progress. I don't think we do much science at my school. 80% of K-5 through Bay Area teachers say that they spend 60 minutes or less per week on science. 16% say that they spend no time at all. Is there going to be a test? The California Standards Test in Science measured students' knowledge of science. Less than half of Bay Area fifth graders scored at proficient or advanced level. Does my teacher know how to teach science? 41% of Bay Area elementary science teachers say they feel inadequately prepared to teach science. Is anybody going to help my teacher? <laughs> More than two-thirds of elementary teachers in the Bay Area say they have received less than six hours of professional development in science over the last three years. 36% have received none at all. 23% of school districts say they have no district office personnel assigned to support science instruction. If we have to learn science, schools need to teach it. Science, teach it. The information presented in that video is consistent with a STAR test data that is compiled every year. Currently, students are tested in 5th, 8th, and 10th grade under the STAR program for California Standards in Science. It's not yet clear if and when other elementary grade levels will begin testing in science. What is clear is that 5th grade students don't fare well. As you can see in this chart documenting science test scores from California's 5th graders in 2007, across the board, more than half of all students are less than proficient in science. In particular, students who historically don't do well in other subject areas also don't fare well in science. Also shocking is that less than 10% of students across groups are above grade level proficiency in science. Scores in 8th and 10th grade show similar patterns of achievement and disparity across racial ethnic groups. Students do worse in science than in language arts regardless of language ability, ethnicity, or economic status. What this tells us is that not only does more science need to be taught in K-8 schools, but also that science needs to be taught better to all students. All this research points to the need for us to change the way we think about science teaching and learning. The American Association for the Advancement of Science recommends that teaching science should be consistent with the nature of scientific inquiry and effective science teaching should de-emphasize the memorization of technical vocabulary, not separate knowing from finding out, concentrate on the collection and use of evidence, start with questions about nature, and engage students actively. Again, the question comes up of how to do this in science. To help us talk about this and discuss some of the misconceptions about science that are common, we talk again with Professor Michael Stevens creed and the nature of, of scientific inquiry really go hand in hand because science is a, a group of people working together to um, grapple with a challenging problem. And, and if, so if we teach science as a process, then it's exciting and relevant and we can both teach um, people to be effective scientists and, or, you know, and I, I'm kind of biased, I think we're training everyone to be a scientist, but that's not actually true. We are training people to appreciate and understand and deal with all of the information. We're in a period of information overload, so it's not information that we lack, but it's the ability to evaluate and to logically assess whether the, the data are valid or not. I think students have a lot of misconceptions, or I'm sorry, misgivings. Uh, students have a lot of misgivings about their content understanding, mm -hmm. and they have the misconception that as a teacher you need to be a dispenser of knowledge. And so they, they feel uncomfortable because they have had limited background and training in science. And so 
I really try to emphasize the nature of science and the process of science. So it's, it, I tell them, I tell the students in class that it's perfectly fine for you to tell your students, I don't know the answer to that question. That is a great question. And model the, uh, the, the way that scientists approach problems. And, and, and then students can learn about the nature of scientific inquiry and the scientific method. And the teacher can guide them and say, that's a great question. How, how would you go about setting up an experiment to answer those questions? What's your hypothesis? So I think that, that simple statement really puts them at ease. And it also sets them up to be more effective teachers. Because um, it's not the old model of the, the sage on the stage. Um, uh, we want to have teachers who involve their students in, in active learning. And, and better yet, if the questions are actually asked and answered by the students. Another misconception that pre-service science teachers have, unfortunately, is that science is dull. And uh, once they experience um, science as inquiry, they realize that it's an exciting process rather than a list of disconnected facts. And I think that makes a big difference to experience inquiry. And, um, students, um, young children anyway, are so keyed in on the why questions. And then by the time they get into the school system, uh, they sort of lose that. And so if we can encourage the, those why type questions to persist onto the university level, teaching will be so much more exciting because I, I, so many times I say, does anyone have any questions? And, and no one does. <laughs> so, so I want to encourage people to ask questions all the way through their K through 12 education and then in my biology classes. Given the current state of science education and the pervasiveness of misconceptions about science, the National Science Education Standards place a greater emphasis on our thinking about science learning as a social process. This has strong implications for the way we teach science, from the way we think about students and learning to the types of classroom and instructional practices we engage in. Some of the shifts that we proposed and that we incorporated into our science methods course are Shifting from treating all students alike to understanding and responding to individual students' interests, strengths, experiences, and needs. Likewise, rather than teachers rigidly following the curriculum, teachers should select and adapt curriculum that focuses on student understanding, use of scientific knowledge, ideas, and inquiry, rather than focusing on student acquisition of information. Another key element is rather than fostering competition across students is to support a classroom as a community environment in which everyone has shared responsibilities as well as valid contributions. Finally, instead of presenting scientific knowledge through a lecture or a text, more emphasis should be placed on developing opportunities for scientific inquiry in which teachers can guide students through the active, authentic, and extended process of scientific inquiry. Taking into consideration these new guidelines and our own philosophy of effective pedagogy, as explained earlier, Cree developed a new prototype for training pre-service teachers with the aim of improving the education of and making effective science education accessible to all students, especially culturally and linguistically diverse students. It was our aim then, through this DVD, to introduce you to our project, orient you to our philosophy, explain to you our expectations of you as a mentor teacher, and the benefits you'll receive for your participation, and finally, to impress upon you the importance of our work in science education and pre-service teacher training. We hope that you, as a master teacher, will join us in this necessary effort through mentoring a pre-service teacher and allowing them to gain experience teaching authentic, content-rich, inquiry-based science using Creed's five standards for effective pedagogy. Thank you for participating in this orientation, and we look forward to working with you this spring.